Congressman John Meltzer of Montana asked the Library of Congress to look into just how much farm income actually goes to agribusiness corporations instead of farmers. They came up with a five to six billion dollar figure. And I interrupted and I said, well, Mr. Butts, if they done it on their own, I says, how come that the Undersecretary of Agriculture was appointed chairman of the committee and they got paid from 16 to $32,000, I believe that was the figure, apiece. You could see, you think, you would think I'd hit him right between the eyes with a cold washcloth. He waited a second, and he says, well, somebody had to chair them, didn't they? Reservation, that if I become the President of the United States, I'm going to use the administrative authority that we already have in the executive branch of the government and in legislation to raise the parity income level of farmers to not less than 90 percent of parity. And I... I've had people say, well, I vote for the man. Now, I don't ever want anyone to vote for me just because they like me. I want them to find out what I stand for and then vote for that. And I think this is what you should do in the upcoming elections. I'm not, this is not a political party. The Choice of Farm Policy is brought to you by NFO Public Information. More bugs have been crawling out of the woodwork which encases the government's farm income figures. Ever since, the Washington Wire of the NFO reporter brought out the USDA's failure to deduct net custom work out of its farm income figures. A $1 billion error of misrepresentation of farm income. Now it develops that at least four or five billion dollars of income is credited to farmers, which they don't actually get. It is income to agribusiness concerns not producers. We asked Ben Stong, a lifelong Washington farm scene reporter, about the figures of net farm income that farmers never receive. Congressman Neil Smith of Iowa revealed the fact that a billion dollars of custom work is not subtracted before net farm income figures are determined. Back in 1955, 17 years ago, USDA studied custom work costs and found that farmers collected 80% of the charges paid out by other farmers, so they just didn't bother with the item at all, either as income or expense. But the agricultural census now comes along and shows that farmers in 1969 paid $1.4 billion for custom work and earned only $509 million for performing it. That meant a net payment to non-farmers of $900 million in 1969. It is now easily over a billion dollars a year of expense that is just ignored when they tell you farmers will make $17 or $18 billion net this year. Mr. Stong pointed out that this was only the beginning of the juggling or distortion that goes on. There is a big chunk of money credited to farm income that never reaches farmers on the land. It includes the value of broilers, for instance, in the hands of the big integrators, about a billion and a half dollars of it. Actually, the farmer producer gets only about 10% of this money. They are paid three to five cents per bird for raising the broilers by the big integrators, and the industry is 98% integrated. The integrators get 40 or 50 or 60 cents a bird for the broilers, but the farmer who raises it does it for pennies. Big agribusiness corporations like Ralston, Purina, and Pillsbury get 90% of that $1.5 billion income. Farm income is thus exaggerated enormously. Congressman John Meltzer of Montana asked the Library of Congress to look into just how much farm income actually goes to agribusiness corporations instead of farmers. They came up with a $5 to $6 billion figure. Ben Stong explained the breakdown figures from agro-business integrators. Broilers are a billion and a half dollars. Eggs are integrated and bring in one and eight-tenths billion dollars. Turkeys account for 800 million a year. 
Vegetables are a three billion dollar item and fruit adds some. We don't know just how much. The Washington Farm Scene reporter told us that agribusiness income is included when they figure income per farmer and per farm total. It is part of the $53 billion gross that farmers are supposed to receive. They divide that $53 billion by the number of farms or farmers and get their per farm and per person data. Professor Bremeyer of the University of Missouri points out that USDA figures have never been revised to take account of the entry of huge agribusiness corporations into farming, either by the Secretary of Agriculture in the Democratic or Republican Party, as they should have been revised. Don Perlberg, now the top economist at USDA, agrees. He recently revealed to the Washington Post that he had proposed to correct the custom work cost emission, but was prevented on grounds that we don't have enough information about it. The correction, of course, would have hurt the political campaign story that is being told this year about $18 billion net farm income. This year, both political parties have written their farm planks. The Democrats strongly repudiated the report of the USDA Young Executive Committee. NFO news analyst Phil Allen reports on the reaction made by Secretary of Agriculture Earl Butts when asked, what he plans to do about the USDA's Young Executives Plan. Wynn Henry is an NFO member from Tremont, Utah. Recently, he attended a meeting where Agriculture Secretary Earl Butts made a speech at Utah State University at Logan. Mr. Henry described his experience to us by telephone. His speech was the usual political speech, telling the farmers what a great bunch of guys we are for producing all the food and fiber for such a low cost. And what a great Secretary of Agriculture that he is going to make and how he intends to help the poor family farmer survive and to raise the prices and how he has already raised the prices for our agriculture commodities. After he got through speaking, wouldn't open it up to a question and answer, period. And next, when Henry tells about how he happened to be in a position to ask the secretary a question. But I happened to be close enough, and I touched him on the arm and said, Secretary Butts, I enjoyed your remarks, but I would like to ask you a couple of questions. I said, Mr. Butts, what do you plan to do about the young executive report? He immediately lost... Uh, his composure, the look in his eyes started to flash. He started turning red. He looked me square in the face and said, where did you hear about that? But before I could answer, he said, you must be a member of the NFO. I said to him, I said, you bet I'm a member of the NFO. Then he started in. And he said, that organization is just a bunch of troublemakers. Your president, Mr. Staley, is nothing but a political demagogue. He continued, he says, you know Staley is uh, on the Democratic Platform Committee, and he is nothing but a political demagogue. It seemed like he just kept throwing that word in there. To set the record straight, NFO President Staley is not a member of the Platform Committee of either political party. However, the NFO has been invited to testify before the platform committees of both major political parties and has done so. And now, Win Henry's report on how Secretary Butts dealt with his question. He continued on the subject of the Young Executives Report, and he says, that report was prepared by a group of young executives on their own. And the Agriculture Department didn't have anything to do with it. He says they prepared that, and he just gave it to us. And I interrupted, and I says, well, Mr. Butts, if they done it on their own, I says, how come that the Undersecretary of Agriculture was appointed chairman of the committee, and they got paid from sixteen to $32,000, I believe that was the figure, apiece? 
you could see you think you would think I'd hit him right between the eyes with a cold washcloth. He waited a second, and he says, Well, somebody had to chair them, didn't they? And that was about the end of the conversation because two professors came up and took hold of his arm and says, Come on, Mr. Butts, you're tired, you've had a busy day, and you've got another meeting to attend to in a few minutes. And that was my first, maybe last encounter with Mr. Butts. But in my humble opinion of Mr. Butts, he is scared to death of the National Farmers Organization because we are trying, and we are the only organization that stands in the way of him carrying out his policy for his elimination of the family farmer. And so I'd say to you, friends, let's block our production altogether and use the NFO collection dispatch and delivery system and spoil Mr. Butts' hope that NFO will silently fade away. Wynn Henry is an American farmer. We have presented his account, told simply, of his sincere attempt to find out what the actual policy of the Department of Agriculture is, and whether the USDA agrees with a series of proposals made by its own young executives to phase out farm programs and get rid of four out of five family farmers. Secretary Butt's speech at Logan was planned not to include a question and answer period, but when Mr. Henry asked a question the Secretary of Agriculture tried not to deal with the question, but to deal with the questioner. The USDA Young Executives Plan is not repudiated by the Republican farm plank. Therefore, most farmers and ranchers are assuming that the Young Executives proposal has substantial support in the administration and represents the plan policy for agriculture in this administration. Some of the proposals would be an end to all farm price supports. Let net farm income drop six billion dollars. Knock land values down one-third to one-half. Eliminate four out of five farmers and eliminate parity. Farm program choices are indeed very clear in this year's election as NFO newsman Earl Miller reports. One of the truest statements about this year's presidential election is that the voters have a real choice between policies that really do differ. On farm policy, the choice is striking. Let's consider first the parity question, or the level at which farm prices should be set. In the present administration, Secretary of Agriculture Butts has said, the promise of 100% of parity is irresponsible, unrealistic, and unattainable, except in wartime, and I don't think George is ready to start another war. George McGovern's views on parity are equally well known. The government parity ratio now stands at only 75 percent. McGovern's pledge is a firm 90 percent, based on a period of time when all segments of the economy were in relative balance. McGovern has never said 100 percent. Here's the way he expressed it in a Des Moines, Iowa, recently. That if I become the President of the United States, I'm going to use the administrative authority that we already have in the executive branch of the government and in legislation to raise the parity income level of farmers to not less than 90% of parity. And I I don't mean the new sliding scale parity formula that was invented here by this administration to fool the people of this country. I'm talking about parity based on the old historic scale from 1910 to 1914, old fashioned 90% of parity. That's what I've been for all of my public life. I'm committed to that, and all it means, reduced to simple language, is that we're going to guarantee the farmer at least 90% of a fair return on his labor and investment. And nobody can quarrel with that. The law McGovern refers to giving authority to set farm prices at 90% of parity is PL 91-524, reenacted in 1970 and still in effect. 
Another farm issue that has developed in this campaign is over the staffing of the Department of Agriculture. Here is what McGovern said on that in his recent Des Moines speech. Instead of this revolving door situation that's going on there now, where you have high-ranking officials in the Department of Agriculture moving back and forth into these great agribusiness corporations, instead of a situation where you have the man who negotiated the Russian wheat deal resigning in the middle of the deal to take a job as vice president of the Continental Grain Corporation, which is making the major profit on that deal, I'm going to look for men and women to staff the Department of Agriculture that have worked the land, that are working farmers, and that understand the problems of agricultural America. One of the liveliest farm issues emerging in the campaign is over the Russian grain deal. Here is what McGovern said about it. You will also find, you will also find on examination that 47 cents a bushel subsidy was paid not to the farmers who sold that grain, but to a handful of great exporters long after the price of the grain had moved to the point where that kind of a subsidy was not justified to those grain shippers, and it came right out of the pockets of the taxpayers of this country, $128 million that I say represents special interest arrangements that are not in the best interest of the ordinary people of this country. But we have presented examples of the clear choice in farm policy, with Secretary of Agriculture Butts and the present administration saying that 100% of parity is irresponsible and unrealistic. Senator George McGovern, running for president, saying there is authority in the present law, Public Law 91-524 of the 1970 Agriculture Act, authority to set parity at 90%. Iowa Secretary of Agriculture, a lifetime Republican, L.B. Liddy, gave an observation for the voters and their responsibility in his speech at the Iowa NFO Convention. I believe, too, that we should keep our government at all levels closer to the people. I've had people say, well, I vote for the man. Now, I don't ever want anyone to vote for me just because they like me. I want them to find out what I stand for and then vote for that. And I think this is what you should do in the upcoming elections. I'm not, this is not a political talk in any sense of the word. I don't care which side of the fence it's on. You better find out what that man stands for and then vote accordingly. The Iowa Secretary of Agriculture immediately joined NFO right on stage after he concluded his address. At the Oregon NFO Convention, Dr. Meredith, representing Farm Management Services from Wichita, Kansas, observed rural America and farm organizations. And it's a joy to be here this day because I believe in NFO. As far as I'm concerned, NFO is the only farm organization in the world that's worth a damn. A lot of these farm organizations tell the farmer that he'll, they'll help him buy something. I never knew a farm yet that couldn't buy what he wanted if he had the money to pay for it. You? Not at all. It's not an easy road. The gentleman that spoke, the two gentlemen that just finished speaking, both said the same thing. It's not an easy road. It's a tough road. And a lot of guys talk big, but they don't come through when the going's tough. And it was old David Parkhurst to New York years ago who said, the problem of this world is the good people get tired of being good a long time before the bad people get tired of being bad. <laughs> and you know and I know that that's true. According to the president of the American Country Life Association, Dr. E.W. Mueller, the vote of the farmer and rural businessman is important because one-third of the total population in the United States live on the farm and in our rural American towns. Yes, the farmer and rural Main Street businessman have a very decisive factor in the influence of an election, the outcome of a victory or a defeat.
The Choice of Farm Policy was presented by NFO Public Information from the Home Office in Corning, Iowa, the Farm Bargaining Center of the World.